okay so let us get started <clears throat> so in the last class we were discussing about allosteric enzymes and uh, <clears throat> the very last thing was the feedback regulation of allosteric enzymes in a biochemical pathway usually the enzyme catalyzing the committed step or, or, or the one of the earliest steps in the biosynthetic pathway is subject to feedback inhibition by the end product of that particular pathway so today we'll briefly look at the kinetics uh, of allosteric enzymes um, and then we'll go into other ways of regulation of enzymes so since you have a positive cooperativity kind of situation where binding of substrate to one of the subunits remember allosteric enzymes are usually multi subunit enzymes so that activates binding of substrates to the active sites of other uh, subunits as well so as a result the initial substrate binding leads to a significant increase in the rate of the reaction because the binding to the other subunits is increased by this and as a result you get this sigmoidal shaped graph um when you plot the you know uh, vmax sorry the rate of the reaction against substrate concentration but still the saturation is the same so therefore the half vmax still remains the same and here uh, since their behavior diverges from michaelis menten or uh, typical michaelis menten uh, equation where you have that um, in a saturation uh, graph so we don't call it as km instead that constant is called k half okay so that's the only main difference and uh, this important change in the graph so initially it is not linear okay so in michaelis menten enzyme it would have been linear so because at the very very initial stage the km is um uh, you know we ignore the concentration of the substrate in the equation and as a result uh, it becomes vmax s by km plus s and when you ignore s yes, uh, vmax by km remains constant so therefore the velocity varies linearly with the substrate right so in this equation um like so we have um, so v0 equals you have v max yes divided by so in this equation a very early we would ignore this so then km by v max remain uh, sorry v max by km remains constant so v0 equals substrate so it will be very linearly with substrate concentration and that situation uh, you don't see in uh, allosteric enzymes because initial um, so initial binding increases binding to the other subunit and as a result as it binds more it starts to increase after a lag period okay so this is characteristic uh, uh, shape of the curve for an allosteric enzyme and when you have a positive uh, interaction like positive cooperativity that is binding to one subunit enhances the binding to the other subunits as we see in oxygen binding to hemoglobin then it shifts this direction so this is uh, with a positive regulation and with the negative regulation it shifts in the opposite direction okay so these are characteristics of allosteric regulation so, so that is all the kinetics we are going to <coughs> learn because you know it, it, we are not going to become enzymologist here. We are just getting a flavor for biochemistry. So this is just to have the basic idea. And uh, many of these allosteric enzymes, in addition to the binding of the molecules, okay, the bind the molecule that binds need not always be substrate. Only in the case of hemoglobin, it is substrate itself. In other situations, I I told you the end product of the pathway might regulate the upstream uh, enzyme. 
So in that case, it is not the substrate, it is another molecule. So it could be any molecule that binds to a catalytic site, sorry, regulatory subunit, um, modifies the overall conformation such that the active site in the catalytic um, subunit is affected. So remember the R subunit, C subunit cartoon that you saw in the last class. So one of the other ways of regulation of these enzymes is covalent modification. So one of the residues on the enzyme, for example, if this is an enzyme, so it has two subunits, it's phosphorylase. So this is involved in um, uh, removal of phosphate groups. And um, when, for a, in this case, the 14th serine, its hydroxyl group, when it gets phosphorylated, it becomes more active. Okay, so in both the subunits, you have two serine residues in two subunits, and when both are phosphorylated, it's active. And when the phosphate groups are removed by phosphorylase phosphatase, so the substrate is this enzyme phosphorylase, and another enzyme phosphatase removes that phosphate group, then it becomes inactive. So, so by this way, you can have a regulation through covalent modification. So this phosphorylation is a very common modification uh, of many enzymes, variety of enzymes, not just phosphorylase itself. So this phosphorylation based regulation of enzyme activity uh, when originally discovered, people did not realize its uh, you know, prevalence among a very large number of uh, proteins. And later when it was realized, this discovery was considered as a very profound, conceptually advancing finding in biochemistry. And it, they were, the scientists were awarded with Nobel Prize for the discovery of phosphorylation as an important uh, enzymatic regulatory mechanism. And another way of regulation is the enzymes are usually produced as a longer polypeptide than the active form. So a part of the polypeptide, usually the N terminus gets proteolytically cleaved. For example, chymotrypsin is produced as chymotrypsinogen. So that precursor forms that are uh, inactive are often uh, you know, named by this addition of gen, you know, trypsin, trypsinogen. Okay. And once it is cleaved by an active version of the same enzyme in this particular case, so you have uh, like these 15 amino acids removed, then you have further cleavages, uh, then you have finally the active uh, enzyme trypsin. Okay, so in this case, chymotrypsin and similarly trypsinogen becomes trypsin. And in this case, it's an enteropept enteropeptidase, entero referring to intestine, okay? Anything to do with the uh, digestive system, you call entero, okay? That's why you call gastroenterologist, the doctor who specializes in digestion-related issues. So trypsin activates chymotrypsinogen by cleaving between this arginine isoleucine and then further cleavages uh, by chymotrypsin itself, resulting in the active enzyme. Okay, so this uh, C terminal portion. And similarly, trypsinogen gets cleaved as shown in this cartoon to become active trypsin. And this sort of a proteolytic activity based activation is common um, in uh, blood clotting pathway as well. And similarly, in uh, complement pathway in our immune system. And also in many of the hormones, peptide hormones, they are activated again by proteolytic cleavage. So proteolytic cleavage based activation again is fairly widespread in, 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 as a regulatory mechanism. All right, so this is all our discussion on enzymes. So we got a basic idea of what are enzymes and how they achieve uh, rate enhancement. You know, the main point you want to remember there is the various non-covalent interactions that happen 
that leads to distortion of the substrate reaching the transition state and the enzyme changing itself to fit to the transition state a phenomena called induced induced fit okay and all of the energy the cumulative energy coming from all these non covalent interactions we call binding energy and this binding energy is the main component of reducing the activation energy so this is a main concept in enzymes that you need to remember then how we relate the rate of the en uh, enzymatic reaction enzyme catalyzed reaction to the substrate concentration using michaelis menten equation and its uh, uh, transformed version that is the double reciprocal plot then you need to remember how the enzyme activity gets affected with various kinds of uh, inhibitors being present then the last main concept is the allosteric enzymes okay so if we know these basic concepts of enzymes then that is good enough for an introductory course in biochemistry um so next we move on to our first major molecules that is uh, car carbohydrates okay so carbohydrates are the most abundant organic molecules on earth um primarily because of or uh, their versatility in terms of uh, use both as structural uh, material like cellulose forms the major structural component cellulose fibrils of the plant kingdom uh, and you know uh, you know the, the amount of plants on earth versus animals and cellulose itself can account for uh, why carbohydrates are most abundant in addition they are uh, very useful as um, storage of uh, energy like the starch that we primarily depend on for our, our energy source is carbohydrate and the exoskeleton of insects you know you you would have seen many insects they have a, uh, their wings are covered by a thick shiny outer cover okay and those shiny things are made up of a variety of carb polysaccharide called chitin okay we will see soon so this chitin and cellulose are extremely abundant so let us get into the basic structures we already have familiarized ourselves with the terms like monosaccharides polysaccharides uh, aldoses ketoses and then glycosidic bond etc so we will refresh our memory and get into more details uh, today so we know carbohydrates um, the smallest units are the monosaccharides which uh, are linked through glycosidic bonds to form disaccharides oligosaccharides and then polysaccharides so first we will see monosaccharides the smallest is glyceraldehyde which has an aldehyde group so it's an aldose and um, it has three groups so there are three carbons so we call it as tri triose so it's an aldo triose <coughs> and uh, you may have instead a keto group dihydroxyacetone so keto triose so fructose which is the common um, ketose that you encounter like for example the common sugar that you add to coffee tea or milk whatever uh, it's a disaccharide one molecule is glucose another molecule is fructose and fructose the name itself tells you is very abundant in fruits okay most fruits contain uh, fructose usually about 4% um, of the fruits weight but some dry fruits like for example dates can have way too much fructose to be healthy so as a result eating dates too much of it is not good for health at all you know completely contrary to tv advertisements that you frequently see um so the word fructose comes from fruit okay it's rich in fruit uh so these two are the most common ones glucose you know starch breakdown product is glucose and uh, fructose exists as a monosaccharide in fruits and in the common sugar these two exist as disaccharide 
So before we go further on uh, to considering the various monosaccharides, let us focus our attention to the stereochemistry a little bit here. So if you look at glyceraldehyde structure, uh, so this carbon is not chiral, it has two same group hydrogen attached. If you take this carbon, one aldehyde group, one hydrogen, and then an hydroxyl group, then you have this, um, you know, the CH2OH group, this alcohol group, uh, methyl group attached here, okay. And uh, so as a result, these are four different substituents and as a result, this is a chiral carbon. So in a chiral carbon situations, you can have two different orientations uh, as we have seen earlier. So the mirror image, you know, this one like here, the hydrogen and the hydroxyl group project towards you and they can have an opposite orientation where the mirror images cannot be superimposed. Okay. So, so two versions therefore are possible. And we usually write them in this form. This is called Fischer projection formula. And we know the perspective diagram that we have learned where the bond orientation is shown like the solid wedge shape shows that these project away from the paper, uh, the plane in which it is shown. And the dashed uh, wedge means those groups are away from this. Like for example, here if you see in the ball and stick model, this all data group and this uh, the CH2OH, they are backwards and these two are front. And in this, you can rotate and have OH on this side as shown here. And these two orientations, okay, HOH, -H, like uh, in a more familiar way in the written format, I'm going to call uh, on the right side or left side. Okay. It's easy to remember when it is on the left, you say L, which is just for memory I am saying. Um, these are just conventions. This doesn't mean dextrorotatory or levorotatory. Okay, don't confuse this with the optical rotation, although these are optically active. So when we have this arrangement, like in the way we write, when the OH is on the uh, right side, it is D glyceraldehyde. When it is on the left side, it is L glyceraldehyde. Okay. Um, so you can have one chiral carbon, you can have two versions. So the number of stereoisomers possible is 2 power n. Okay, so if you have two carbons, chiral carbons, then 2 power 2. If you have three, then it is 2 power 3 and so on. Okay, so if we go back and look at it, this has only one. Dihydroxyacetone, no chiral carbon. If you take glucose, you have one, two, three, four. So as a result, it has 16 different versions possible. And um, of which the 16 can be separated into two groups, eight the D version, like HOH in this orientation, and L where this will be on the OHH orientation. So there are eight names, D, so glucose and so on, like D glucose, D galactose, D mannose, two, D idose and so on, eight names. And then the same eight with L. So since it's an introductory course, I'm not going to introduce all those names or expect you to remember all of them. But at least you should be able to draw the structure of D glucose correctly. Okay. And this, um, DL reference, we use the carbon that is farthest from this aldehyde group. Okay, the orientation of the hydrogen and hydroxyl are the chiral carbon that is farthest from the functional group, this aldehyde group. In this case, this will be the one. Fifth carbon, one, two, three, four, five, six, this is the fifth carbon. So in this case, it is uh, this itself. This is the chiral carbon farthest from this because there is only one and so on. Okay. So this is the uh, five-membered uh, aldo 
sugar aldohexose sorry aldopentose then you have uh, ribose without the hydroxyl group deoxyribose this is in rna this is in dna okay so the next important uh, feature of carbohydrates is their ability to form intramolecular ring structures okay that comes from this reaction so the aldehyde group can react with an alcohol group leading to the formation of what we call hemiacetal okay so this carbonyl group gets reduced to hydroxyl group and since you have another hydroxyl group that can react with another alcohol group like this then when both are uh, uh, substituted in that manner you call that as an acetal so usually the aldehyde group with one of these hydroxyl groups will form a hemiacetal okay and when that forms you have an additional oh group available and when that oh group this one so this is an intramolecular linkage in a typical aldose like glucose and the resulting hydroxyl group when it forms uh, a glycosidic bond with another sugar so when the oh group it reacts is intermolecular it is from another sugar molecule then it forms an acetal okay so glucose glucose is linked in uh, sucrose in starch is therefore is an acetal linkage okay similarly ketone with an alcohol can form a hemiketal and ketal when it reacts with alcohol group of another molecule okay um, hydroxyl group from another sugar it forms ketal so this reaction is very critical because this is the basis for the ring structure formation so here you have for glucose this aldehyde group most often it is with this fifth carbon hydroxyl group and uh, this uh, reaction all did alcohol condensation leads to a ring structure and this ring structure we usually display in this hexagonal form which is called a haworth perspective formula so this is the fisher projection formula and this is the haworth perspective formula uh, in the uh, this is not exactly haworth in the perspective formula we would have used those wedge shaped uh, bonding to show the projection as well but this hexagonal ring is usually uh, is referred to as haworth because haworth proposed this first so an important point to consider here is when this ring structure forms you are generating another chiral center see this double bond or this carbon is not a chiral carbon but once this ring forms it is a chiral carbon and this carbon is called the anomeric carbon okay and two sugar molecules for example in this case these two differ only in the orientation of the substituents of this carbon all other uh, groups the, the the orientation of those groups on these carbons are all same only here it differs and the sugar molecules that differ in this fashion are called anomers and this carbon itself is called the anomeric carbon so in aqueous solution this uh, all, like one orientation we call alpha and the other orientation we call beta by convention when you show the oh it's on the top you call the beta and below it is called o, uh, alpha so in starch what you have is an alpha d glucopyranose okay so orientation on this carbon is the reason for d and orientation around this anomeric carbon is the reason for this alpha so the normal glucose is alpha d glucose okay this pyrene i'll come in a minute why we use this word pyrene as well so the main point is this 
inter intramolecular hemi acetal formation results in the generation of additional chiral center and that chiral carbon is the anomeric carbon and when two molecules differ in the orientation of the substituents only in the anomeric carbon they are the anomers and in solution one form rotates to the other form readily and they inter uh, you know interconvert readily and that process we call muta rotation this these do uh, rotate the plane polarized light so the dextro and levo rotatory comes from this carbon and in solution they exist in a certain equilibrium uh, i think this is more than this uh, you do not worry about that detail but the conversion of one optically active form to the other optically active form with respect to anomeric carbon is what is muta rotation okay and these this in this fashion this ring structure resembles the organic molecule pyran and therefore we call them as pyranose so the proper chemical name for glucose is alpha d glucopyranose so now you know why is it alpha why is it d and why it is pyran and similarly this ketones keto sugars they resemble furan and therefore they are furanose so alpha d fructo furanose uh, d comes from the fifth carbon and alpha is from the first carbon that formed the um the hemiacetal uh, hemiketal uh, structure here so this is the basis for the way we uh, for the nomenclature of the uh, monosaccharides so now uh, we look at some of the derivatives of the monosaccharides that are uh, really important so this is the first one glucose we know very well so this is the most common one so here it is shown in the beta form oh it's on the top okay uh, so the naturally occurring uh, su sugars are mostly d version so therefore we are going to uh, for our convenience ignore the l versions so all of them are going to be d so it's d glucose so here this diagram is beta glucose so quite often the second hydroxyl group is substituted with an amino group so they are called glucose amines and these amines are often substituted with an acetyl group so because it's an amino group that is substituted with acetyl group we call this n acetyl glucose amine so these are usually uh, present um attached to lipids or proteins in our system as glycoproteins or glycolipids and they become important functionally in many different situations so we will consider them when we get to those uh, actual context uh, so these are very prevalent and in addition you may have phosphate groups these phosphorylated versions are very important because the phosphorylated versions do not readily get out of the cell so it helps in trapping the monosaccharides in the cytoplasm uh, because there are no transporters for this phosphate version for phosphorylated versions and second this is an uh, activated uh, bond here compared to this hydroxyl group the alcohol group this phosphorylated version is more reactive so this is an energetic form uh which is uh, a good substrate for further reactions okay for example formation of polymer like glycogen in the liver so you have phosphorylated version then uh, in addition to this uh, amino group as well as this acetylated amino group sometimes you have an r group in the adjacent carbon the third carbon and that r group is usually lactic acid okay and this lactic acid substituted and then this uh, uh, lactic acid substituted version of glucosamine so this structure is glucosamine with the lactic acid we call that as muramic acid so this muramic acid also may have uh, acetyl group n acetyl muramic acid so this is a very important component of bacterial cell wall we will very soon see that 
and these are the, some of the modified versions but basically the major modification is the amino group which gets derivatized with acetyl group and sometimes you might have a lactic acid attached as well and um, so this is other you know the galactose i mean mannose i mean uh, like that and some of the sugars might have a methyl group instead of a hydroxyl group in the fifth position of uh, fucose ramnose are examples they are from mannose and galactose respectively then uh, the, you may have a situation where the aldehyde group here this anomeric carbon may be oxidized to a carboxylic acid form and they are called as <coughs> aldonic acids so glucose is like gluconic acid or gluconate in the ionized form and they usually react with this alcohol group and form ring structure called glucanolactones some of them may have similar oxidized form in the ch2oh sixth carbon and they are called uronic acid in this case it is glucuronic acid okay aldonic acid or alduronic acid aldonic acid means the first carbon alduronic acid means it is the sixth carbon that is converted into carboxyl groups um so in addition to this common derivatives one other important components that we often encounter in our uh, system uh, where uh, usually found in glycoproteins is this n acetyl neuraminic acid this neuraminic do not confuse with neuraminic this is neuraminic this is neuraminic this is six member this is a hexose derivative while this is a nine carbon so the r group has three here and they usually have acidic group as well as an n acetyl substitution as well the common name is sialic acid and this is a very important uh, modification of glycoproteins required as um, you know address tags we will consider it towards the end of this chapter so these are some of the derivatives of the common uh, hexoses that we are familiar with so uh, a third important property of carbohydrates is their ability to reduce um, you know potential oxidants for example cupric ion can be converted into cuprous by this aldehyde group so this aldehyde group so this remember this uh, hemiacetyl is always in equilibrium with this um, unlinked form so let me go back to it to highlight that point so this version hemiacetyl is in equilibrium with this aldehyde version so if you are going to draw this away through another reaction then it is going to tend towards this to balance and reach equilibrium and therefore more and more of the cyclical form the intramolecular linkage is cyclical and that will get linearized and used up in the reaction so in this version do not ignore its ability to behave like an aldehyde and its ability to behave like an aldehyde is because of this equilibrium and um, so due to this so this one is in equilibrium with this linear form and in the linear form this acts as a reducing agent and such sugars are called reducing sugars okay so in a long chain of alpha 14 linkage of glucose like which is the um uh, starch or glycogen so there one end of the chain will have a glucose molecule like this its uh, fourth carbon is linked but the first carbon is uh anomeric carbon is not linked in glycosidic bond so therefore this can be in equilibrium with this aldehyde form and this can reduce so that end of the amylose uh chain that has this free anomeric carbon which is free in the sense it's not engaged in glycosidic linkage can act as the reducing end okay so that's the 
convention for why it is called reducing end and this ability to reduce is the basis for a test called felling's test so here the uh cupric ion becomes cuprous and that in alkaline condition can form a reddish precipitate this was the basis for detecting glucose in the blood and used as a diagnosis for diabetes so you may not have seen anyone doing this but when i was um, a kid in school age uh, most of the grandparents when they were diabetic and they were asked to do the uh, glucose measurement in their urine uh, at home itself they will do this test so it's it's standardized ready made thing available and they will do it and they'll find it is the solution itself will be blue if it is greenish means they are okay uh, but if it is reddish brown then the sugar level is high but nowadays we don't do that we do lot simpler and more accurate one which is based on this enzyme called the glucose oxidase so which forms this gluconolactone remember uh, this structure okay when the aldehyde group is oxidized to carboxyl group and when that readily forms this ring this ester linkage carboxylic acid with this alcohol hydroxyl group that is the gluconolactone and that is what glucose oxidase does using oxygen as the other substrate you get the gluconolactone the other product formed in this is hydrogen peroxide which can be converted with the help of another enzyme and that oxid uh, that reaction can result in colored product and that is what we measure using peroxidase enzyme and um, uh, remember i have told you about catalase and peroxidase when we were talking about um, uh, the turnover number so using that enzyme we make colored product and since that enzyme has an extreme uh extremely high turnover number it's extremely sensitive so very small amount of glucose also can be measured using this two enzyme coupled reactions so for essentially for me measurement the end product has to be colored therefore you can use a simple colorimeter where absorbance is based on the concentration of the given colored substance and uh, we calculate the amount of glucose present so it is all because of this reducing end this aldehyde group okay so now we move on from monosaccharides to disaccharides okay so again remember the monosaccharides we considered aldoses and hexoses when i say those two names remember the functional group aldehyde and ketone then the other important thing we learned is hemiacetal hemiketal formation that resulting in additional center of chirality so anomeric carbon so these are important co concepts then the common derivatives of uh, amino group and n acetyl derivative amino group and so on so the next one we are going to look at the disaccharides so two glucose molecules in starch itself or cellulose itself is a disaccharide so you can consider them as a disaccharide repeating unit apart from that there are carbohydrates that exist as disaccharides as such for example in milk we have beta d galactose like this this hydroxyl group is shown above the ring and therefore it is beta uh, so beta d galactopyranose is in glycosidic bond with glucopyranose that is again beta so that beta 14 linkage between galactose and glucose is lactose this is the primary sugar present in milk lactose okay and here you have a reducing um, end here so therefore lactose is a reducing sugar and one other important detail i want to tell is when two sugar molecules like for example if you take glucose or uh, and another molecule where they differ only in the orientation around one of the chiral centers they are called epimers 
okay glucose and galactose are epimers so we have learned enantiomers diastereoisomers anomers and epimers enantiomer mirror images diastereoisomer the same structure but the functional groups are um, attached to two different carbons such that they are not mirror images therefore they are diastereoisomers if they are mirror images there are enantiomers and when the orientation differs only around anomeric carbon they are anomers if the orientation any of the one single chiral center they are epimers okay uh, sucrose on the other hand has an anomeric carbon and another anomeric carbon okay so here we have inverted the structure so fifth carbon is here the first carbon anomeric carbon is here of fructose so 1 2 and this is beta orientation and this is alpha orientation this glucose when you have glucose fructose joined like this this is sucrose so here both the anomeric carbons are engaged in the acetyl formation so this is acetyl so this structure is analogous to this okay so uh, since we are talking about uh, one of them ketose it is analogous to this structure so this itself is if you consider as the an internal ring this is like the, this r is the glucose and uh, this whole thing is the fructose in sucrose and in such a structure you have no reducing group available and therefore this is non reducing sugar similar is the case with the trihalose which is glucose glucose um alpha 11 linkage this is a disaccharide present in the circulating fluid like the blood equivalent in insects and this is important uh, source of energy for insects so these are the common disaccharides that we encounter so when you take starch and convert into disaccharide like glucose alpha 1 for glucose it's called maltose and maltose is often present in some of the cereals and um, so that is where you have this malt uh, in some uh, nutritional supplements they are more readily digestible than large starch molecules and then finally we move on to polysaccharides polysaccharides are quite simple the long chains of monosaccharides and we already saw alpha 1 in amylose part of starch and uh, we saw the branches alpha 16 branch in amylopectin of starch so starch therefore has amylose and amylopectin unbranched and branched versions and glycogen is more like amylopectin but with a lot more branches than amylopectin so this is the common storage carbohydrate in uh, animals particularly in liver is where it is stored um so then you may have heteropoly these are homopolysaccharides because this all monosaccharides are the same like glucose so when you have different uh, monosaccharides are joined they are called heteropolysaccharides so you may have two alternating ones and you have multiple ones and so on okay so we we'll look at structure of some of them like for example one of them we need to look at chitin because we are familiar with starch glycogen cellulose cellulose is glucose but beta 14 linkage so chitin we we'll look at it so chitin is beta 14 so the hydroxyl group is above so therefore you show like this okay um instead of showing it down and this one has an n acetyl group so it is n acetyl glucosamine so this group is n acetyl glucosamine in beta 14 linkage with n acetyl glucosamine and therefore it is beta 14 this disaccharide keeps repeating so beta n acetyl uh glucose i mean repeat is what is chitin and that is what is this shiny exoskeleton of insects okay so this chitin the disaccharide is called chitobiose 
and this chitin is the second most abundant organic molecule on earth only behind cellulose so you may have seen you know insects are very large numbers not only insects or other arthropods like shrimp prawn etc their exoskeleton also contains chitin and the chitin molecules are used as biomaterials in tissue engineering as well so understanding their chemistry is very useful for many applications too so the third is heteropolysaccharide so what i'll do is i'll stop here we will consider heteropolysaccharides and other derivatized form of polysaccharides in the next class so so far we had minimum derivatization this n acetyl amino group is the only addition we have seen so we are going to see lot more complex versions and they are very important in our extracellular matrix so we will take them up tomorrow